So in this lecture, we would like to discuss uh, different cryptographic protocols. Actually, I am not going to discuss several of them. I will pick few cryptographic protocols and will explain how those cryptographic protocols work. So these protocols are the practical example of cryptography which we use uh, in the our day-to-day -day application. So first of before we go into the discussion, I have listed a few cryptographic protocols that we can see from the history to right now. Uh, those protocols, some of them are very popular. Some of the protocols are obsolete, uh, but most of those protocols kind of uh, protocols to change, protocols to kind of change the world or kind of the protocol, cryptographic protocols, which uh, we can use as the big example for uh, different uh, applications. Sir, the so sound is a little bit poor, sir. Microphone. Uh, is it low? Yes, yes. Now it's uh, high. It's okay now? Yes, it's okay, but uh, some side noise may be. Uh, Let's see. Uh, can we connect back? Then, okay, it's it's okay, sir. Is that okay now? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. So if if sounds uh, sound goes, good, sir. Ah, uh, it's good. Right. All right. Okay. So let's discuss few uh, internet cryptographic protocols from history. Uh, to write down, <coughs> and we will see uh, some of these in detail in a minute. Uh, so one of the famous cryptographic protocol which used in the IP layer is called as IPsec protocol. So IPsec protocol mainly used to protect the uh, communication between uh, two IP networks. So we can configure those protocols between host to host us to uh, security gateways and security gateway to security gateway. So we, we are not going to discuss this in detail today. Uh, so other major protocol we use in uh, internet is the DNS security protocol. You know, DNS is a crucial entity. We are especially in case of cyber security. Uh, as you know, DNS servers are the servers which give the IP address of the end user, or IP address of the servers to the end user. So if DNS uh, gives a wrong reply, so all the kind of uh, en en entities like browsers may uh, redirect into the wrong servers. So what the response we get it from the DNS server should be authentic. authentic. So DNSSEC protocol basically provides the security of DNS system. So most of the DNS servers in the world now deploy the DNSSEC protocol. Some people misunderstand that DNSSEC requires the confidentiality is not so. DNSSEC protocol only achieves the authenticity of these DNS responses. So IPSEC and the DNSSEC is a, a crucial kind of like a very important two network security protocols, cryptographic protocols work in the network layer. Uh, today, I just not I don't, I don't go into the detailed discussion of these two. Uh, so then, when we move on to the cyber space, that is internet. So we can see several security protocols from the history to right now. The PCT and SHTTP are the few his, historical candidates. So PCT protocol introduced by Microsoft uh, in somewhere 90s. Uh, uh, parallel to the SSL protocol introduced by a company called Netscape. So now the Netscape is uh, Netscape source code is the foundation uh, for the Mozilla uh, browsers, as everybody knows. Then PCT and SSL was introduced these two competitive companies in 90s. Somehow SSL uh, won the battle. And the rest of the world agree to use SSL in the web communication. 
Uh, after that, the Internet Engineering Task Force, or what we call it as IETF, uh, take, has taken this protocol and standardized and produced the international standard for web communication. So that standard, we call it as the TLS, Transport Layer Security Standard. Uh, TLS is kind of a major protocol we use in the cyber or the internet communication. Uh, today, I would like to discuss that uh, in detail. TLS provides very nice example of a cryptography. TLS is a very nice example of cryptography protocol. If you consider the payments, like electronic payments, uh, electronic fund transfer protocol or SET protocol was the historical protocol. Uh, unfortunately, nobody uses it. But this uh, theoretically, SET protocol has a very good uh, design on uh, cryptography point of view. Nowadays, you know, uh, there are cryptography heavily applied in the area of cryptocurrencies. So different cryptocurrencies we can see in the world. So those cryptocurrencies heavily work based on the different cryptographic algorithm, especially based on the hashing algorithms and the public key algorithms they use in the uh, cryptocurrencies, such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, and so on. So those cryptocurrencies, obviously, I am not going to discuss today. And in addition to the set, basically, there was a fund transfer protocol called CyberCash. That was a historical protocol. Kind of nobody used it. I mentioned that for the historical reason. CyberCash to the set, now we are in the era of cryptocurrencies. Uh, most of the cryptographic, uh, interesting cryptographic protocols where which, uh, electronic fund trans uh, now connect to cryptocurrencies. Uh, when, then we consider the uh, email. Email is a famous application over the internet, you know. Uh, when you think about the email, there are two major uh, protocols we can see. What we call it as a PGP, pretty good privacy protocol, and SMIME, secure MIME standard. SMIME is the international standard for kind of a data protection or the email protection, document protection. Uh, PGP is a de facto industrial standard where people voluntarily use. Uh, so in the case of email or the document communication, uh, PGP and the SMIME is the, uh, the, uh, the major protocols we use. And in more, if you want to connect to the remote servers, as you may know, Secure Shell, SSH is the major protocol we use. SSH is uh, uh, used as authentication protocols plus encryption protocol. SSL mainly based on the public key cryptography. So the two endpoints, web server and the client endpoint, both can have public private keys. If both has public private keys, these two parties can authenticate each other with those keys. Sometimes server can have public private key, the client may not have that. So in that situation, only authentica uh, authentication is provided by the username password. Uh, public private key used to establish session key and encrypt the channel. So SSH is uh, heavily used, especially in the networking field. As you see, there are uh, uh, there are uh, several interesting cryptographic protocols uh, which we use our day-to-day -day application. Uh, since we have only two hours, I don't have time to discuss all of them. Uh, I have selected uh, TLS and PGP protocol uh, to uh, demonstrate or to kind of uh, explain you the, how such cryptographic protocols work. Using this TLS and PGP, I will show you uh, how we could, uh, how this protocol internal uh, structure of those protocols look like and how these protocols work between uh, different parties. So this, this discussion might help you uh, to understand any uh, internet cryptographic protocols. Right, let's start the discussion with the TLS. TLS started with a protocol called SSL, Secure Software Layer Protocol, 
which was introduced in 1994 uh, by a company called Netscape. Uh, and there was a competitive protocol, as I said, from Microsoft called PCT. Uh, somehow in 1999, Internet Engineering Fast Task Force standardized SSL and uh, created the first version of the TLS. Uh, now most of the web servers use uh, TLS version 1.2. Uh, TLS protocols uh, you, uh, provides us basically uh, authentication of the web servers. Uh, encryption of the communication between web server and the browser, uh, plus uh, integrity, data integrity of these uh, in between these two entities. Uh, TLS provide authentication, as I said. Actually, TLS provide authentication of the web server. Uh, that is mandatory in the protocol. Uh, authentication of the web browser is also supported by the protocol, but that is optional. As you know, by default, web browsers, they may not have public-private keys. TLS implemented this authentication based on public-private keys. Web servers only has public-private keys. Therefore, TLS works with web server authentication, confidentiality, and integrity of the web communication. I have a list of some documents important in the history of TLS to understand the history of TLS. So if time permits, you can have a look on those documents, what you call it as RFCs, where you may understand the evolu evolution of TLS protocol. Uh, so TLS, uh, name it as Transport Layer Security Protocol. The name confused most of the people. Uh, since it's called Transport Layer Security Protocol, people think it works with the TCP layer or the transport control layer. So actually, it is not. TLS works in the application layer in the typical internet file layer architecture. Uh, TLS protocols uh, implemented on top of the TCP layer. So obviously, there is a protocol called IPSF protocol. As I said, it is works in the IC layer. Uh, so the TLS goes as a transport layer protocol, but it is not in the TCP layer. It is on top of the TCP layer. So in, in addition to this TLS cryptographic or security protocol, there are other protocols work in the transport layer, as you know, like HTTP, Telnet, FTP, LDAP, and so on. All of them are transport layer security. Uh, all of them are application layer protocols. TLS also application layer protocol, even though we name it as transport layer security. So when you look at this, how this TLS works in the file layer architecture, so you know like basically there are uh, four layers in the network and the fifth layer is application layer. All these interesting protocols which we use day to the application in the application layer. So let's say HTTP web, if they require security, so the HTTP can uh, talk to the TLS or what we call it as SSL actually, it's TLS. Uh, and then TLS talk to the TCP to complete the communication. If that HTTP protocol does not require any security, they can directly hold to the TCP port or the TCP layer and then do the communication. So all the application layer protocols has the flexibility uh, to talk to TLS and get the security or not talk to TLS uh, and communicate without security. So this is kind of a, a arrangement in the TLS protocol in the protocol stack. It basically in the TLS communication, uh, so there are two kind of phases we can see. In the first phase, TLS do negotiation of the algorithms, and they agreed on the couple of cryptographic algorithms to be used. And based on these algorithms, they share some sacred uh, common secrets, and those secrets used to establish the session keys. So those use with these session keys, TLS move into the uh, data encryption stage uh, to make sure the privacy and integrity of this uh, communication. Uh, when you look at the overview of the TLS, 
basically any browser in the world supports the TLS and obviously the web servers, different web servers like Apache, Nginx and so on, they support the TLS. So in order to use TLS, web server should configure it with public private keys. So those public private keys should be, uh, public keys, uh, private keys should be stored in the machine or specific devices such as what we call HSM, hardware security modules. Especially banks use such special devices to store private keys. Otherwise, usually we store the private keys on the web server. Uh, so private keys we keep sacred. So the public key, as you know, we need to be published to the rest of the world. So we publish the public keys of web server as public key cryptographic certificates, or in other words, we call it as digital certificates. So those digital certificates uh, issued by the organization called certification authorities. We have discussed about the certification authorities and public infrastructure in our last lecture. So today I will show you how to use such a free public key certification server called Let's Encrypt. Uh, we will demonstrate in a minute. Right. So how the TLS works? Uh, so in the TLS support web browser, uh, usually connect to a web server. So with the uh, TLS protocol, so you can visually look like that when you browse the internet. If you can see HTTP slash slash and the server name, it is a plain text communication. If you see HTTPS slash slash and the server name is the TLS. When you see HTTPS. So you know that is TLS. So if someone types HTTPS, your browser starts executing TLS protocol. So the first message goes from the browser to the web server called TLS hello message. With that TLS hello message, browser propose set of cryptographic algorithm to the web server. For example, browser might see, I would like to use uh, AES for encryption. Uh, RSA for signing, or maybe Diffie-Hellman key exchange algorithm, and so on. So there are methods we propose those cryptographic algorithms. So those methods, what we call it as a cypher suite. Cypher suite. Using this cypher suite, browsers uh, propose different cypher suites, kind of set of cryptographic algorithms, to the web server. When we configure the web servers, we need to configure the cipher suites or kind of a cryptographic algorithm we would like to use at the web server. So based on this configuration, web server selected the possible cipher suite for the communication. That means browser and the server agreed common set of algorithms to continue with this TLS. Then in the meantime, web server sends its public key certificate to the browser. When browser receives the public key certificate, browser has to verify the authenticity of this public key by verifying the signature of the certificate. Signature of the certificate is verified by the public key hardcoded in the browser. I have shown that there are hundreds of certification authority CA certificates are hardcoded into a uh, browser distribution bundle. So using one of these CAs public key, uh, browsers will verify the authenticity of the public key it receives. After verifies that public key, it gets it verified properly, browser accepts this public key as the correct public key. Usually when you get the certificate to the web server, the domain name of the uh, web server should include it in the common name field of the public key certificate. So browsers check whether the common name of the public key certificate equal to the domain name of the web server he, he about to communicate. If that verification, all verification succeeded, browser start the, what we call it as, uh, key exchange. Browsers use uh, two types of key exchange, the DC-Hellman based key exchange or RSA based key exchange. 
in the first generations of CLS protocols heavily used DP Hellman key exchange. Then people realize there is a problem, what we call as man in the middle attack with DHO, the DP Hellman key exchange protocol. So they have moved on to the RSA based traditional key exchange algorithm. So, so we have discussed the both crypt algorithms in last lectures. So then with the traditional RSA based cryptography algorithm has a security issue, what we call forward secrecy problem. I'll discuss in a minute. So because of that later, uh, recently, most of the TLS versions like 1.2 recommended to use uh, uh, DC Hellman cryptography key exchange or the DC Hellman key exchange together with RSA. So we will see how it works uh, practically. So somehow one of these uh, key exchange protocols, we have we exchange the security key. So after we exchange that security key, both the browser has and the web server has this security key, same key. So that is we'll call it as common sacred value. Maybe we can say sacred value R. So those R is used to derive other keys and other authentication. Uh, parameter. As I mentioned, TLS key exchange uh, can be done using DC Hellman or the typical RSA. Uh, so the recommended method right now is a DC Hellman with RSA. I will discuss how it works. Uh, if Hellman with e e RSA or elliptic curve, I will discuss how it works. Uh, so in a minute, right. So before I move on to the, uh, the key exchange protocol, present key exchange protocol, let's have a look basic key exchange protocol which we used few uh, years ago. So in the basic RSA key, base key exchange protocol is uh, very simple. It is, I will discuss for the historical reasons. So in the basic RSA key, base key exchange protocol in the TLS works uh, simply like that. So first of all, the browser creates a random number called R. Obviously, before this key exchange, uh, web browser should receive the public key of web server. So browser knows the correct public key of the web server. So assume that is EPK, encryption key, encryption public key. So the browser generate random number R and encrypt that random number with the public key of the web server. So the result is the C. So web browser send that C to the web server. So then the web server use his private key to decrypt that C and he get back the R. So then both parties web server and web browser has a common R. So then they can use this R as a master secret to derive the other keys. So that is traditional historical RSA key exchange. So in this, uh, you obviously understood so in only web, web server has public private keys and the web browser use that to send the secret. So after that secret receive at the web server, web server has no way to authenticate where this C comes from. So because of that, is the, uh, this TLS protocol can run to some kind of man in the middle attack based on some social engineering techniques as well. We are not going to discuss those in this class. I have discussed those in my first course, uh, which I did in the cyber uh, introduction, uh, the cyber security course, I have discussed those attacks. So the idea today to discuss in detail those cryptography protocols, right. Now, Let's discuss what forward secrecy means in the uh, domain of cryptography. So when you discuss practical cryptographic applications, forward secrecy is, secrecy is very important concept. So people should realize that what it is. The forward secrecy refers to the security secrecy of our information, not, the, not in the present state, also in the future state. So if you protect some data today, if someone can uh, easily uh, preserve this data and open it in the future, so we say it, this cryptography 
application nor the protocol may not have the forward checker. So for example, let's say we encrypt our hard disk using DEX algorithm in 1990s, and we have some sequence encrypted with this, uh, and that is some some person archived it, maybe some attacker archived it. In 1990s, this algorithm cannot broken, and so it's very strong in 90s. So so, but if someone archive that encrypted data or keep a copy of that, today they can break it because this is not. Uh, these keys are uh, can be brute force now. So then someone can basically uh, brute force the disk key and decrypt that hard disk which is which was encrypted in 1990 and get the information in 2020 after 20 years. So that means this was not supported forward secrecy like that. So that is the idea of forward secrecy. Similarly, TLS protocol. With the traditional RSA based key exchange, not support the forward secrecy. Why so? So, for example, if a web, web browser encrypts that master secret and sends to the web server, some attacker can record this entire key establishment session. And plus, he records all the communication between the web browser and the web server. So, by hoping, he will be able to break the web server public key in the future. He can break it crypt, uh, by brute force since the computing power will be increased, or he can attack the web server and get the private key. As soon as attackers get access to the private key of the web servers, he can decrypt all the historical key establishment and get all historical R which those browsers use for exchange those, uh, encrypt those communication. So after they get those R's, they can decrypt the entire communication, historical communication, and get access to those information. So because of that, we say RSA-based uh, key exchange, it is not supported for secrecy. If you want the for secrecy, so the best a cryptographic key exchange algorithms to be used is DC Hellman key exchange algorithm. In the DC Hellman cryptographic uh, protocol, designed only for the exchange of the security keys, so actually they are not exchanging the keys, they exchange the, their public keys each other, and those public keys used to calculate the keys independently. Those keys are independently calculated in the DC Hellman protocol. If they archive those X and Ys, they may not be able to kind of get access to private keys because in the DC Hellman protocol, after the, they do key exchange, they will destroy those values. Plus, they don't have a private key store on those DC Hellman private keys. Stone either web server or not neither kind of browser. So in the DC Hellman, they are generating a private key. This is simple X and simple Y. You remember those protocols? So those things actually used to do the key exchange. And after they ended up with a common key key, they usually destroy those values. They are not going to store those keys in any place. Since they are destroying those values, so either party or any attacker may not be able to access those in the future. So they may see those X and Ys if they archive it, that's it. So they may not get access to simple X or simple Y, so they kind of destroy it. They are not going to store any in the system. So because of that, we, 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 we identify DC Hellman key exchange as the Protocol, key exchange protocol is a proper uh, key exchange protocol with forward secrecy. Unfortunately, you know, DC Hellman protocol is vulnerable to the what we call it as man in the middle attack. Uh, that means some attacker at the middle can force the browser and the web servers to establish the keys with attacker. So then there should be two key pairs, one from browser to the attacker. So other one from attacker to the web server will be established. So then 
the communication from browser to the attacker will encrypt and that at the attacker point is decrypted and re-encrypt back to the web server. So, so attacker will listen entire communication. So that's what we call it as man in the middle attack in cryptographic protocols. So such man in the middle attack is possible because those parties just don't know these public keys comes from which one. It's with, so for, for example, web server doesn't know whether it comes from browser or the attacker. Similarly, browser doesn't know it comes from the server or the attacker. So because of that, this element is vulnerable to the man in the middle attack. In one side, uh, RSA is not vulnerable directly to these su such attacks, but RSA has a forward secrecy issue. If you have money, do not have any, does not provide, uh, 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 if you have money, uh, uh, is a very good protocol to overcome this forward secrecy issue, but it has the problem of man in the middle attack. So what would be the solution? The so present solution we are using for uh, to overcome those uh, the situation is actually uh, we use deep element protocol. When we exchange those public keys X and Y between browser and the web server, they X or Y those values will be digitally signed. Digitally signed using RSA or elliptic curve. That means. Diffie-Hellman parameters or Diffie-Hellman public keys which we exchange between the web browsers and web servers are digitally signed. So then attacker may not be able to produce the same uh, values. So that is the solution uh, which we use. That means actually in the key exchange, we are using two public key cryptographic algorithms, Diffie-Hellman and RSA or elliptic curve uh, to establish a proper uh, uh, key between these two entities. Right. Using such key exchange, uh, TLS will establish a security key. So after that, entire encryption goes with the traditional cryptography or symmetric key encryption. There they might use DES, triple DES, or AES. As you know, recommended algorithm there is AES. So in addition to that, in order to get integrity purposes, we need to use uh, kind of uh, integrity algorithms like uh, SHA uh, 256 and so on. So basically, with, after established the session, TLS encrypt entire communication. TLS protects the data on move. So the data at rest is not protected by TLS protocol. It protects the communication channel between the browser and the web server, entire communication channel. Integrity of the TLS achieved by the message authentication code. For that, it used uh, popular hashing algorithms. So basically, as typical hashing, what happens if there is a message, we calculate the message authentication code, and after it sends to the other side, other side will verify this message authentication code recalculating it and check with that atta uh, attached one. So that's how it achieved the uh, integrity. I mentioned that TLS provides a partial authentication. That means the web browser get a facility to authenticate the web server. There they do less authentication using the uh, protocol called challenge response protocol. Uh, so first of all, obviously, when the browser receives the public key of the web server, browser authenticate the public key. That means browser verifies whether this public key is issued by the certified by a uh, trusted certification authority. After that, a browser accept this public key. Uh, just accepting or just verification of authentication of the public key will not provide the authenticity. So that provide only the identity identity of this web server. So if browser wants to authenticate, browser has to verify that particular web server has access to its private key. 
So that verification confirms the authentication because public key can be sent by anybody, not the, that particular web server, because public keys are public anyway. Attacker can say also send that public key saying, I am web server XYZ or whatever. So just verifying that public key may not complete the authentication. After this public key gets verified, browser has to check whether this corresponding web server has access to his private key. How the simple method browser used to do so is challenge the server. So for example, browser can create a random number and encrypt that random number using the public key of the web server and sends that to the web server. So web server can then decrypt it and respond to that. So browser send the challenge, challenge is encrypted random number, server send the response. Response is decrypted random number. If server has access to his private key, server should be able to decrypt that properly. Browser can verify that comparing these two random numbers. So if browser receives the same random number after decryption, so browser knows the web server has access to his private key. That's why the data which he encrypted using the web server public key will perfectly, correctly decrypt at the server side. So that is how TLS do the authentication. Right. Then we will have a look uh, in detail TLS protocol architecture in order to understand that cryptographic protocol. So in the TLS protocol has four sub security protocols, what we call hash check protocol, chain cipher specification protocol, TLS alert protocol, and TLS record protocol. These are the four sub protocols. Uh, uh, bundle in the TLS. Uh, TLS record protocol is the major protocol which uh, used to achieve the confidentiality and integrity. TLS handshake protocol which establishes the sessions like key exchange, authentication, and so on goes with the TLS handshake protocol. Uh, TLS change cipher specification protocol used to change the Cyber specification at the middle of the communication, and alert protocol will use to exchange the error messages and alert messages between these two entities. Uh, so, since the TLS record protocol is the major protocol, we will have a look in detail about this TLS record protocol. TLS record protocol basically provides the confidentiality and integrity of the communication. Let's see how it achieve that goal. So let's say we have a data to be communicated. So this is maybe a web page. This data may be a web page or that data may be a, uh, the data which entered into a web form. Right. So this is a data which communicate between browser and the server. So in the record protocol, first of all, chunk or cut this data into the pieces, what we call record protocol unit. So these are the fragments of this data which we have. So then we apply the security to each and every fragment. So that's the important thing you have to understand. TLS not take the entire document to do the security. Instead, they divide that document into the protocol unit and apply the security to each and every protocol unit. So let's consider one protocol unit. So then, so after we get that protocol unit, so the first operation we do to that data is compression. So we do, we compress this data. So we get the compressed data of the protocol unit. So then this compressed unit, uh, we calculate the hash of that data. We have the compressed data, we create the hash of that data. So then we put that hash and this compressed data and encrypt that data with the session key we establish. So this encrypted data will 
passed to the TCP layer. TCP layer will divide that data into the TCP protocol units and add the TCP header to each and every unit and passes to the IP layer. So IP layer divided into the IP protocol units, add the IP header and passes to the media access control layer and so on, you know, the, uh, the layered communication architecture. That's what happened. So let's say that data reached to the other side. So from the physical to the Mac, to the IP, then to the TCP. So from the TCP reach to the TLS protocol. So the TLS receives encrypted data packets. So first operation do at the receiving end, the decryption of this data packet using the session key. Obviously, two parties already established the session key. After decrypt that data packet, uh, the recipient will receive the compressed data unit and the hash. So then they verify, recalculate the hash of this compressed unit and verify the verified with the hash it received. If both are hashes are equal, the recipient knows this packet may not change. So after that, they de decompress it and get the protocol unit that is part of the document. So similarly, each part will be communicated in the TLS protocol. So as you may see, this is this this steps provide the encryption and hash calculation. Hash calculation for integrity purpose. Encryption is for confidentiality process. Basically, we put hash and, and the data and encrypt the data including the hash in the protocol. And you may understood that there is another operation here. It's compression, data compression. Why, why do we do compression? Basically, we do compression to save the bandwidth and so on. So you know when you do the apply the security, it always at the overhead to the data. So all the uh, ciphertext size usually larger than the plain text size. And also after encrypting, we need to add security headers. So that also creates the largest ciphertext. So we want to keep plain text and the ciphertext equal size. So how do you achieve that? We achieve that using compression compression. So you might ask a question, why do you do compression here? Instead we do encryption and then we can do compression and pass us to the TCP. Can't we do that? Basically, if we do that, we may not get the good compression gain. As you know, compression algorithm works based on the repeat, repeat patterns available in data. So if some data set has more repeat patterns, or more data get repeated in the data, so we can get good compression rates. If the data is equally distributed, so we cannot compress them. Actually, we can, but there are no, we may not get the good compression rates. So in order to get a good compression rate, we need to compress the plain text data. So that's you have to understand. So for example, that is, is general case. So for example, if you have, let's say, hard disk uh, to be protected, you can encrypt that hard disk. And then maybe if you think you need to save some space, you can then try to compress it. Obviously, there you may not get good compression rate. So if you want to do that, so first you have to compress the data, and then you do the encryption. And there you can save the disk. So encrypting a compression, so you can try that, I will show some examples. So basically the rule is do the compression first and then apply the security and then do the transmission. So that's how TLS do the communication. Right, so now I would like to see how practically we uh, set up a, a TLS server or what we call TLS web server. So nowadays, in order to set up this TLS web server, some of the ser servers use a protocol called, or, uh, well, some of the certification authorities use a protocol called Automatic Certificate Management Environment, ACME protocol. ACME protocol 
is heavily used by the one of the free certification authority in the world called Let's Encrypt. Let's Encrypt provides a free certification to anyone so they can obtain the six month valid public key certificate from Let's Encrypt automatically using ACME protocol and set up their TLS server in a minute without any hassle. If you want to do that manually, you have what you have to do is you have to create a public private key pair for your web server that you have to most of the time you have to use OpenSSL to do that. So then you need to create what we call it as public key certificate request. So that public key certificate request should be submitted to the uh, certification authority. Then certification authority certified that public key and issue what we call it as public key certificate. So that public key certificate you have to download from the certification authority and then you have to configure it in your web server. So all those steps will automate it using ACME protocol. So with the Let's Encrypt Certification Authority, uh, with help of the ACM protocol, we can configure web servers like uh, Apache or Nginx uh, in a minute. So implementation of ACME protocol, uh, free implementation of the ACME protocol is uh, provided by uh, software call it as setboard. So you can use this setboard. Uh, so you go to the setboard EFF.org website, right? Setboard website and install the setboard in the server area you have the uh, web server installed and the setboard will automatically communicate with the certification authorities like Left and Crypt and obtain the public key certificate to your web server and configure that in your web server configuration file. I will demonstrate now how do you configure SSL TLS enable web server uh, in uh, uh, in a minute. Right, for that, uh, let me share my uh, desktop so it's easy for me then uh, uh, to show you those things. Uh, right, I think I have shared entire desktop. So right, I will exit my uh, presentation for the moment, and uh, uh, let's let's set up a, a web browser. Uh, let's set up a web server, right? Here. So I will, uh, in order to demonstrate that, I get a domain name from one of the domain name providers. So let's say I have a domain name called icecube.center. So I want to set up a, a web server for that, right? First of all, you know, in, in the DNS management, I need to put an IP address of the server. So there I need to get a server instance. I use Amazon EC2 to get a server instance. So I get a cloud server instance from Amazon Web Server. As you may see, I am running a simple server. So, so in the public IP address on this. So I have to configure this IP in the domain name. So I have then uh, this server which connect uh, to this domain. Right. So then I need to log in. Uh, to this server. So, uh, so I have already logged in. So I exit that. So this is my terminal. I just logged into the server. Uh, in this server, basically, uh, using. Let me see. Where am I? Right uh, here. I have. Uh, uh, so I will uh, basically I get the terminal. Uh, 
there is a script I have created. So this is a SSH command basically used to log into a uh, Amazon instance. Uh, so you see it's used public key based authentication. So SSH minus I and give my private key to having the authentication. And then this is the username of the remote server. So this Amazon instance, as you see, use this IP address. So I need to then log into this IP address. Uh, I have to say SSH uh, minus I uh, and my public key here. And then username is Ubuntu. Ubuntu. Uh, uh, in the because I got the Amazon Ubuntu instance and the IP address is there. Uh, I remotely log into that. So then I have logged to this Amazon instance where I run the uh, Apache web server. So obviously I have to install this instance then Apache. So for that you know the command sudo uh, apt get install. Apache 2. So I run that. I already installed that. So it says install. If it is not installed, it will install uh, the Apache on the server. Right. After that, I have to do few configuration. So to install uh, setbot or the ACM implementation on this web server uh, to obtain this public key certificate from the Let's Encrypt CA. Uh, so this is basically less encrypt certification authority, the famous free certification authority. So uh, using this headboard, I can automatically connect to this CA and obtain the certificate. So in order to do that, first of all, I need to uh, set up a headboard. There are few commands should be issued to set up the set board. First of all, I need to set this uh, software property common. I need to install that. And then I need to install, I need to add the repository to universe to this uh, repository. And then I need to add the repository called set board because set board repository is not by default set it with the Ubuntu. So I have to add the set board repository using to do at repository PPA set board, set board. That will add the uh, set board repository into this uh, server. So like I add here uh, this. So basically it's already added. So there. Yeah. Right. So after we added that repository, we can automatically fetch and install the set board. So using this command. So when you install the set board, so you need to add the set board for uh, your web server version. So since I'm going to use this set board with Apache, I will add the Apache version of that, like here. So I say sudo apt get install Python set board Apache. Apache uh, setboard implementation for the Apache web server. So I already added, if not, it will add it by this command. So that's all I need to do. Then rest of the things will take care of the setboard. That means after we added all these, uh, I run set, can run the setboard and obtain the public key certificate. In order to do that, I have to execute this command. The terminal, and then I execute this command. So it's a set board. I'm executing the software set board, which I just installed now. And I say I want to install it into the Apache web server using the option slash dash dash Apache. And then in the minus D option, I can tell the set board I need the public key for this domain. So I am getting a public key certificate for a domain called icecube.center and domain called www.icecube.center. Both domains, I am getting one public key certificate in one, one goal. So using minus D, you can add 
different domain which is required to add into this public key certificate. So basically the command is set forth and then option is Apache since I'm going to configure the Apache web server minus D will give the domain name domain name which I want this public key certificate. So when I enter that set bot will automatically do that. Since I have already installed the certificate it asks whether I do want to reinstall it or whether I want to renew that certificate. Uh, so I can say reinstall it because I already do that. I say over and then you see it uh, do send my key, get that corresponding public key certificate and everything and then it uh, asks some other uh, questions. The sec this question what he asks is whether I want to redirect entire my plant test traffic into the uh, SSL server. So that is the good thing to do. So basically I select to redirect. So then my entire web server will running with HTTP. If HTTP, uh, HTTPS. If HTTP also traffic comes, it goes to the HTTPS server. So everything comes on the encrypted channel. So I pick two. Uh, so since this already set it up, it's already set up, otherwise it will set it up. And then everything has done. Everything has done. So it's automatically get the public key certificate and install it uh, in this server. So I can check that. I go to this server, uh, icecube.com uh, here. Maybe that have. I go to www. Uh, icecube center web server. It's a simple web server which runs. Uh, only one page is called iServe, right? So it's the web server root, you know, it's located at uh, this, right? Uh, the, uh, the CD. So this is the web root directory of my web server. When you see index HTML5, yeah, you see it's uh, only this iServe. So that's what I get it here, right? That is my web root, right? So my keys, you see, my keys are located here. This is, uh, my certificate is located here. So let me go there. So for example, ATC, uh, let's encrypt uh, live. And when you get, uh, sorry, I need to do sudo. I go to the root prompt and then cd to the directory. So when, when I get, let's say we are running a multiple servers here, so this directory will create a multiple directories which have the store the private keys and public keys of those servers. So you see it has this private key. Uh, public key and private key. So this is private key and this is public key. So you see this is my public key certificate and this is my private key. So this is full chain. That is root CA and the certificate of that uh, web server. This is a certificate. So if you want to list them, you can use open SSL. Uh, let me see the command actually. I forget the command here. You can see if you want to list those uh, public key certificate, you can run that command here. There, you can see that public key certificate issued by less than fifth server and it's automatically fresh and installed, installed on the server. All right? So so this server is running. So even by clicking that, you can see this certificate is valid. So this ice cube data center, these are the certificate details. You can see the details here. Kind of, uh, I showed this day and things like that uh, uh, by the less encrypt server to this ice cube server. 
Uh, you can get the settings here as well all the settings of them. Plus, maybe if you want to uh, get the detail, uh, check that security of that, you can use a website called uh, SSL Labs. Maybe you know about this website. In the SSL Labs, it's a good website where you can test uh, your server configuration. So you go to that, then you can give your domain name to be tested. Uh, so <coughs> that is your domain name. You go to the, uh, you use SSL Labs uh, and ask the SSL Labs to test it. <coughs> uh, <coughs> sorry. So it will test the uh, SSL connection uh, of this server and give the details. So I would like to show you some things there. So you see it's server, uh, this is certificate information of the server. Uh, it's issued by the Let's Encrypt server, signature algorithm with this and so on. This is uh, additional certificate supplies to that. And so they are still testing them. After test complete, uh, it tells you uh, cipher switch and other parameters. Uh, let, let's wait to that uh, so uh, to complete this test. So if you have to set it up the server, so you can use this uh, SSL lab um, to verify this configuration. So you see in a minute, using less encrypt web server, uh, CA server and set board package, we can set a TLS web server in very easy. So the objective of less encrypt to encrypt entire web. You know, without having proper public key certificates, we cannot set up a uh, TLS servers. Without setting up the TLS servers, we cannot uh, do TLS communication. So, so the less encrypt server try to issue your public key certificate to anybody who wants to set up a TLS server in the world. So then everybody get a, uh, ability to encrypt their traffic between these web servers and the browsers. So uh, this SSL Labs basically uh, will check all the configuration and rate the web server. So actually I got B grade. So you should get A plus grade if you properly configure it. I might have some issues on the work, my web server configuration files. That's why I got B grade. Uh, actually, it seems protocol support is not good. So I want to show something. The public key certificate received from the less encrypt is And these are the details available on that uh, public key certificate. And so when you go down, so this is, uh, it shows the protocols which supported, uh, it says TLS 1.2 supported, 1.1 and 1.0 also supported uh, to a backward compatibility. Actually, when you configure a TLS server in the Apache configuration file, you have to disable these two. So uh, we, that's, uh, we should use only TLS 1.2. So these two we disable. Since it is enabled, so that's why I got the B grade. Uh, 1.2 is the recommended TLS version. And the other very important thing you have to look at is hypersync, cryptographic algorithms we are using. So that is our topic, practical cryptography. So you should understand which kind of cryptographic algorithm is used to establish this communication. Here you see it support TLS, EC, DHE, RSA with C, 20, policy 135 SHA256, something like that. You see, right? So it's a D ECDSA RSA AES128 ECM. This is hash and so on. So what are those? Those are the cryptographic algorithms. You see, so EC, D, this is elliptical DC Hellman. It uses elliptical DC Hellman key exchange protocol. 
and it also used RSA signatures to, for signing. So it used SH256 hashing algorithm in the signing. This, this is uh, DC Hellman, since it used elliptic curve, we have to tell kind of uh, which curves it used and things like that. So this is the algorithm, encryption kind of algorithms in the elliptic curve PHU. So it, in this case, it supports that T size is in this algorithm 256. Support this also, it is T size is 128. It support this also, it's T size is 250. You see, it's used GSM one. You see, it used, this is says elliptic curve, DC Hellman key exchange, RSA signing, AES algorithm with 128 size. Encryption mode is GSM, hashing algorithm uses 256-bit hash. So here the similar, but the encryption key is AES256. Here the encryption algorithm we use defined in this policy. So then here you see AES128, but all those operational modes you see GSM, GSM modes. We discussed script. Block type operational modes in the class you see operational modes are yes and hash sizes so you see these are the recommended systematic algorithms which must use in our web application. However, when I configure my server, I also enable this weak algorithm. Because of them, that some attacker can degrade my implementation, I need to disable those algorithms. So those algorithms you see, which says not recommended V, you see it's DC element RSA, DC element AES, and so on. Those are kind of uh, algorithm now we not recommended at all, the uh, orange color one, right? So. So these are the best algorithms now we can recommend. Right? Especially algorithm is 256-bit like here. Right. So then other interesting part of that uh, test is this. So it shows how different versions of the browsers available in the world negotiate with this my web server and establish these keys. So as you may see, when I use Android 4.3 to Android 4.3 version, since I have weak key, weak cryptographic algorithms, so those Android versions established with the weak cryptographic keys, weak cryptographic suite. So 4.2 above has proper strong establishment. And you see then these are the browser types. So popular browsers, browsers basically goes with the proper uh, key sizes, and there are some browsers you see uh, which might uh, negotiate the wrong key size, kind of weak key size. Like that, these are the Safari versions. Like that, they will test different browsers, different operating systems uh, uh, with that different browsers, different operating system with that particular server and see whether how these two endpoints, A and entities like browsers in this machine negotiate the key with my server. So if I have this weak key configured in the server, so some of these clients may establish this weak keys, weak algorithms. So that is the issue when you configure in TLS systems. So you have to disable those in the TLS configuration files available on the uh, your web server. You can find this SSL or the TLS configuration file in the Apache in this place, right? Or different web TLS servers, you can find it in different other places. So that's how you set it up and tested uh, TLS connection. So that's how you practically use public key uh, uh, this cryptography in the web server communication. Right. Now let's uh, discuss, uh, move back to our uh, presentation. 
uh, and discuss uh, one more uh, the slabs I, I discuss uh, other one major application over the internet and the security protocol is available there so as you know in addition to this web browser communication email are the most popular protocol available in the internet so this is the best definition for the email which i very much like so this person defined the email as postcard written in pencil so if you get an email you know uh, written in a postcard you should understand so that is, that may not have any confidentiality because anyone can read that that is a postcard uh, and it may not have integrity because the message is written in pencil so someone can delete and write some other message plus uh, there are no authentication because anyone can write anyone else the postcards right so emails are such documents when you use email we may not get any authentication we may not get any confidentiality we may not get integrity and so on so even though we use emails we, these emails may not support basic security requirements such as authentication confidentiality integrity and so on in case we want those security there are two security standards which we can use one is pretty good privacy other one is s mine pgp is one of the common popular system we use and SMIME is a standard method of uh, securing the email. Uh, so PGP popular system because of that, because it is free. Plus it may not require public key certificate. If you want to use PGP, we can directly use it within the group, between friends and so on. We don't need any uh, uh, public key certificates to use that. So PGP and SMIME both supports confidentiality, authenticity uh, for the email communication. Let's have a look how PGP message look like to understand the cryptographic part of it. So if the PGP was to protect the email message, that's how we protect it. So this side is operation, this side is different segments of the email. So this is, let's say this is your message, this is your message. So you want to protect that. So in the PGP, what they do, first it creates the message digest. That means it creates a hash of this message. After it creates the hash of this message, the PGP encrypts this hash using the private key of the send. Encrypt this hash using the private key of the send. So that means that is actually digital signal. And then they put the time of signing and other parameters and all together this part is the signature of the email message so in the pgp what first the pgp system do they have a message create a hash and sign that hash using the private key and put the signature so this is then sign message in the pgp so after when you put the signature it provides three security features as you know so that is authentication integrity and non repudiation of the security feature with the signature. So what we need now is the confidentiality. In order to achieve the confidentiality, we have to encrypt that message and the signature together. So as you see, before we do the encryption here, we do the compression. The TLS protocol also, you remember, we do the compression. So this is SIP, that compress. We signature and the message we compress. So after the compression, we do the encryption of this compressed data. We encrypt it using a session key called EK. So this is a symmetric key. Actually, we encrypt the message using the symmetric key. So then we need to send that symmetric key to our recipient. How can we do that? In the PGP, what we do, we get that session key and encrypt that session key with the public key of the recipient. E publish the public key of the recipient. We should get the public key of the recipient and encrypt that session key with the public key. And finally, entire data structure we encode. As you know, email is a text based message and exchange system. We do 
A64 encoding to convert this binary data into the text. And that text message is transmitted to the recipient. So email recipient receive base 64 encoded message. They will decode it. Then they will get the session header and the encrypted content. So then the recipient should get that key by decrypting this header using his private key. So after decrypt the header using the private key, he get the session key. So using the session key, he can decrypt the content. So then if he can unzip that. So then he will get the signature and the date. So he has to verify the signature then. So how do he verify it? He, he recipient decrypt the header hash using the public key of the sender and recalculate the hash and compare those hash together. If both hash are equal, the signature verified. So, so the PC, PGP message verified. So that's how we create a PGP protected message. So that's how we can protect our email. So as I mentioned, PGP system, they don't use a public key instead of people exchange their public key each other. I can maintain list of public keys which are trusted by me, and similarly, the different people can maintain the public keys trusted by them. So we can exchange those public keys with each other and trust each other, uh, an entire public key distribution based on users, not based on the certification authority. The other, other standard we use uh, for protecting email is SMI or SecureMind. It is an extension to the Internet Mind standard. So in the SMI entity uh, uses the standard, what we call it as public key cryptography standard number seven or PKCS seven. Using the PKCS seven standard, we can create the S mine protected message. So this is how S mine signature data structure look like. As you see, it also has several sections. This content information is the email. So it has the content type, this is whatever text mail or whatever, and then content, that is our email message. This is content information. So if in the sign data, what we try to do is put a digital signature for that. How do you do that? We get the hash of that, right? And we encrypt this hash using the private key of the sender. So, and then create the what you call sign information field. The sign information field had a version, sign ID, that means who is going to sign, digest algorithm, which hashing algorithm used, authenticated attribute means time of signing, digest encryption algorithm means which public key algorithm which used to sign, maybe RSA or elliptical, and then finally this field is signature. So that's how SMIME PKCS 7 signed data structure look like. Similarly, if we want to do encryption with SMIME, we have to use PKCS 7 analog data structure. So this is how PKCS 7 analog data structure look like. There are uh, we have the content, you know, so, and we have two section main section for recipient information and encrypted content information. Encrypted content information looks like that. It has a content type and content encryption algorithm. Content encryption algorithms are the symmetric key algorithms such as A, A, S, O, triple Using this algorithm, we create a key and using that key, we will encrypt our content. So, which has the encrypted email content using the symmetric key algorithm. And this algorithm name, we put it there. All together, we call it as encrypted content. Then the key we use to do this encryption, we have to send to the recipient. How do you send that? We get that key and encrypt that key using a public key of the recipient. So that is called as encrypted key. Encrypted key is the key of this algorithm encrypted to the recipient public key, recipient's public key. And key encryption algorithm, it's a public key algorithm name, maybe RSA, we use that here. And then 
the recipient 90, that is the name of the recipient, and versions all those together because it has recipient information. In other words, in the encryption, what we do, we create a symmetry key using the symmetry key, we encrypt the content, and this symmetry key is encrypted to the recipient using the public key. So that's how we do the encryption. As you see in the uh, S, uh, SMIME sign, we have a one data structure, envelope, we have a different data structure in SMIME protocol. So, but in the practically, we need signatures and encryption both. So how do you achieve the both? Basically, we do one after other, like a workflow. We first do the signing, and then sign data, we put it into the encryption, and we encrypt that. So for example, we create the signed data, so this data structure, this entire data structure, we put it there as encrypted content, and then we do the encryption. So that we create sign and analog data, the PGP. After that, we will encode it and put it into the, our email body. So after create this SMIME message, it might look like that, analog message, and analog uh, SMIME based sign message look like that, right? Uh, unfortunately, if you want to use SMIME, we have to use standard public key certificate. That means we have to obtain a public key certificate from the certification server. That means we have to create public private keys and we should send our public key to the certification authorities and ask them to sign and get those certificates back and so on. So that is really uh, kind of a uh, not simple task. So what in the PGP, we don't need to do so. So the PGP systems are because of that so popular. And you know, nowadays we are not uh, kind of, we, we, are, we are using online mail systems like uh, Gmail, Yahoo, and so on. So those online systems are not support PGP or SMIME. Why? Because those online servers, they uh, generate the income by showing advertisements in order to show user-specific, customized advertisements, those email service providers need to read our content. Actually, when you use Gmail or Yahoo, they are accessing our email content. That is the reality. So those companies have to read our content uh, to give you, to generate the income. So they are never ever support these two standards. So if they support these two standards, they may not see our content, then they cannot uh, throw the personalized address. So that's why those companies are not supporting these two international standards. So in other words, we are using emails, they don't have any security. Anyone can read that. Obviously, this uh, service providers reads those content and no integrity, no confidential and so on. So if you want to, still you want to use online system and to get security, so there are some plugins developed by different people. There are some SMIME plugins and my, uh, PGP plugins with support to different browsers. Among them, uh, uh, I recommend to use uh, PGP plugins because those PGP plugins are simple and they don't need to use any certification authority. So one of the PGP plugin I use called Mail Analog. So this Mail Analog plugin I see very simple to use. So that support like Gmail, Yahoo like email system. So if you want to use PGP with your Gmail account, so what you should do is you have to add this Mail Analog extension to your browser. So I will show some demo on that. So for example, if you want to add the mail analog plugin, you go to this Chrome extension and add it, then you may see this mail analog tag. Let me share my uh, window again, uh, my uh, desktop again to show that. Right? Uh, so I will share the uh, desktop. 
so and then my uh, browser so in the, my browser as you see uh, so you can add the uh, go to this extension uh, form extension and add this extension so you can see this mail analog extension added right so then after you add this mail analog extension so you have to create the keys yourself so that so you go to this dashboard so you go to the dashboard and you go to the manage keys there you can generate keys public private keys for you so for example if i want to generate keys i go there generate key and i can type my name and i can type my email address let's say this is my yahoo email address uh, and then uh, I'll show you and i can enter a password like that uh, re enter the password uh, and then i don't want to upload to the server if you want you can upload your public key to the key distribution server by clicking that and you say generate so it will generate a public private key for you and they're stored in a different format which is called pgp format uh, so so it generates the key and those key basically stored. You see this key now stored. So this is my key ID algorithm is RSA. My key size is 4096. Right? If I go back, I have two key pairs. So this is my key, default key I use with my Yahoo uh, Gmail account. So this is my Gmail account I use. It's a valid key uh, and created by. Uh, uh, I created in 2019, uh, so so it is RSA 4096 uh, size right? So this is my how I created my uh, public private keys. So after that, I can use this plugin to encrypt the retrieve files, emails, and so on. Obviously, after you generate the keys, you have to do a few more things. One is uh, you have to export, export this key. Because if you start encrypting the mail, maybe sometimes uh, your browser may crash or you have to reinstall your system. So then if you reinstall the system, you have to restore the same keys. Otherwise, you cannot read your email again because your emails are encrypted with those keys. So it's better you export those keys and save it in a secure place so where you can use to import later on using this key management so you can import later on you can export the key when you exporting it there are two options first thing is you can export all public public private keys to be archiving purpose and then other thing is you can export your public key why do you need to export your public key because you have to give that public key to your friends. So then your friends can send the mail to you. So if you want to, uh, your friends need to write to you, you should give that public key to your friends. So then they can uh, use that public key to send encrypted mails to you. So what you should do, you export your public key, save it into a file, and pass us that public key to your friends. So then after that, uh, that key is received so your friends can import that import that uh, import import those keys by putting that file here right so that's how we manage the public private keys in the pgp plugin so this plugin is available for different browsers so this is the plugin for chrome browser so if you want to use that uh, for mail uh, so you Go to your Gmail system. So since I am using my keys, I will write into myself. Uh, so I compose a, a message. Uh, let me compose the message here. So after you, I write to myself. Uh, I write to myself. 
and I say hello, and I say hello, whatever. So this need to be now encrypted. So what I should do, I put this mail in a lot plugin. So they need whatever type I put it there. If I uh, want to type something else, I can type there, and I say encrypt. So you see this plugin is automatically created this PGP encrypted message. I described you the format. Do all encryption, signing, encoding, and put that encoded text here, saying it's a PGP message. Right? So after this creation of the PGP message, message happens in the local browser, right? Not at the Gmail server. So it executes in the local browser. And when I send that, this PGP message then sends to the server. So then the recipient will receive the message. So the plugin will automatically identify. So this is the PGP message and put that logo. So I can click that. And after I click that, it asks a password to access my private key. So I say, OK, it gets my private key and decrypt the message and show back on the this window. Right. So in order to access that, actually, the person needs to access the private key. So if you don't have access to private key, so the message may look like that. The recipient message may look like that. No one can create that. So for example, so let's say someone has a snoof and get your Gmail password. And that person logs to your Gmail account using a different browser to access your data. But they cannot read that data because they don't have private key. Your private key is here. So they may not be able to read that. Similarly, if in case you want to read your message on the way on the move, if you want to read your message maybe at the airport, so you want to log into that, so you cannot read because you don't have your keys. Your keys are on your laptop, not at the airport so, or airport machine like that. So there are plus and minus points. So obviously, the PGP can give you a simple uh, mechanism to protect your confidential data. If you have any confidential data or confidential message to be exchanged, you can just create the PGP keys and manually exchange those keys or exchange those keys somehow using USB devices or uh, email again uh, in a different medium, and then use those keys to encrypt your content. Right. So with that, eventually we reach to the end of this lecture series. Uh, so we, are, we discussed basically uh, cryptography, heavily cryptographic protocols, and we discussed how uh, practically apply these protocols into uh, our day-to-day -day system. So if, uh, if you remember, we start the discussion with the historical cryptographic algorithm, and then we move that discussion uh, to kind of, uh, we move that discussion uh, to kind of uh, 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 different uh, cryptographic algorithm, uh, symmetric algorithms, asymmetric algorithms, and then we uh, discuss the uh, different cryptographic algorithm operational modes uh, and so on. And then finally, we discuss how do you distribute keys. And then we uh, discuss uh, uh, some practical cryptographic uh, protocols. So, so one for browsing the internet, that is TLS. And we discuss how we could configure those TLS practical cryptography into the practical application. And other one is PGP. Then there we discuss how we configure this uh, PGP into the email system. In addition to that, the most important thing I uh, covered in this course is uh, Java part of it. So I demonstrated how do you really program? How do you really create real software with those cryptography. So if you want to create a software which do store the encrypted files and 
assign documents. Now you know how to do that. If you if you want to kind of create uh, password based systems, now you know how to do that like that. So I have given entire theoretical part plus practical part of cryptography during this eight lectures. 